Welcome to Now What. I'm Carol Zimmer. My guest is the First Lady of New York City, Shirlene McRae, and we're going to be talking about life. <laughs> One thing that really interests me is that you um, are in the public spotlight. Mm -hmm. Your husband is the mayor. You're the First Lady of New York City. You have two children. How do you balance the private life in the public glare of the spotlight? Mm -hmm. how, how does that it's a tricky little equation. I, you're right. It, it is tricky. And I'm not sure I have a, a, a great answer for you. I can tell you that we do carve out private time for ourselves. Uh, we have our, our rituals and our routines. And we, you know, we don't let a lot of people in because um, that would kind of destroy the whole, the whole mission of, of, of keeping our private time private. Um, and and that, that helps a lot. Um, you know, we work, our, our, our young people are grown now, so it makes it right. a lot easier to, to do that. Um, we, we work very hard and very long hours, but we do know how to turn it off when we, when we want to. And how come you decided to move to Gracie Mansion rather than, as we talked before, mm -hmm. I'm a resident of Park Slope, you're yes. a resident of Park Slope. Mm -hmm. How come you decided to give up the community and say, I'm moving to this amazing Gracie Mansion, <laughs> the house, the public house of the mayor of the city of New York in the middle of a beautiful park? Mm -hmm. But how did you make that choice? Well, we didn't give it up, first of all. We didn't give up our community. We Is couldn't it? do that. We, yeah. We're very connected um, to our community as, 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 you know, as we were before. It was a family vote. Um, we all decided to you know, make our own personal decisions and, and then bring it up to the family to vote. And, and uh, it was three out of four of us. <laughs> who didn't want to move? <laughs> I'm not going to tell. <laughs> you probably can guess. <laughs> really? He didn't want to move? No, no, he really didn't want to move. But it really was not practical to stay in terms of safety, in terms of work, in terms of, you know, so many things. It yeah. just didn't make sense. We have a very small house and and yeah. uh, here we can work, um, you know, all the time. <laughs> you met we in met Mayor in, Dinkins' office. In City Hall. In we met City? in City Hall, right outside yeah. his office. <laughs> you did? Yes, we did. And so how mm -hmm. did it, was that like a, a quick courtship or how did that yeah, it just... Took a, it took a little while for us to, <laughs> to get together. For him, as he, he always says, it was love at first sight. And, uh, but it took me a little a little longer. <laughs> yeah. And mm -hmm. here you are. And here we all are. These yeah, years all these later. years later. You know, and I have worked in, in other, you know, I, I worked in publishing before Bill. I worked at uh, Maimonides Medical Center for uh, nearly five years. I've, I have, and I've worked as a speechwriter for, for years. Right. So um, it's not as though we've, you know, consistently been in government together. I just yeah. think that um, because you know government encompasses so much, yeah. it makes it hard to not be you know, involved in it in some mm -hmm. way. First ladies, they pick an area to kind of focus on, concentrate on, mm -hmm. because otherwise it would be all over the place. You're looking for like a mm -hmm. a particular subject that you can try to make a difference with, a particular area. That's the tradition. Okay. Mm -hmm. Did you, you chose mental health? I chose mental health because I, I thought that mental health would be the best, um, the best uh, issue to cover everything that I am concerned about. And that is what? That is, I know, I, know, I mean, that's humanity, a big Carol, <laughs> humanity. It's like humanity. Listen, if you could make us all better, Shirley, <laughs> I would be really happy about that. We could use it. We could. It's a struggle to be human, isn't it? It I'm, really is. We've got physical health, you know, covered as much as we can for now, and you know, we've got a lot more to do. But oh, no one goodness. pays attention to mental health, and I know. You know, you look at um, our schools. You look, Subways, you know, slick, because slick, wait, one more thing: schools, children walking with trauma, unable to graduate because of, you know, anxiety, depression. You look at our subways, right? You yeah. look at our shelters. Yeah. Uh, a third of uh, the the women 
in our family shelters are there because of domestic violence, yeah. another sign of untreated mental health conditions. Mm -hmm. uh, you look at our prisons and our jails, 40% 40, 40 of our, uh, the incarcerated are, you know, are, are suffering from some kind of, of mental illness. That's like, and that's yeah. just getting started. I can go on like that. Yeah. I mean, it is just absolutely unfathomable to me that we have not addressed this. We have never had a behavioral health system, a well-funded, coordinated mental health, a behavioral health system in our country ever. Yeah. And that's just so astounding, yeah. given that we have uh, the scientific understanding of, of mental illness and substance use disorders that we do. We know how to treat these illnesses. Yeah. And Although, you know, physical illness is one thing, you know, you break your leg and you, mm -hmm. the doctor knows how to fix it. I'm not sure that, you know, I, as I told you, my husband's mm -hmm. a psychotherapist and, yes. and, and it seems so much more amorphous, mm -hmm. the idea of how you deal with mental health, how right. you deal with bad moods, how you deal mm -hmm. with depression. You had depression in That's your right. family mm -hmm. when That's growing right. up. That's right, but that was in the 50s and 60s. That was a yeah. long time ago. I mean, there are, you know, there are evidence-based studies about how one can approach treating depression now. Uh, this is information that is widely available. We, we have, and we have um, so many places and people to, to address this, but we're not doing it. We're just not doing it. Well, you know, we have seen, I mean, mm -hmm. Bill's father, I, right. did I read this? His, he committed suicide when Bill was 18. Bill's father died by suicide, yes, when he was very young. And we had uh, Anthony Bourdain mm -hmm. uh, recently, Kate, Kate Spade, Spade. Robin Williams. P yeah, mm -hmm. People and people around them said, oh no, I never expected it, I mm -hmm. never heard anything about it, I never thought that would happen. Mm -hmm. It seems very mysterious. And particularly, mm -hmm. I go back to Anthony Bourdain and I think, really? Like, really? Like in a hotel room in mm -hmm. some foreign place and right. leaving an 11-year-old? This person must have been in incredible pain right. to do that. That's right. That's right. And mm -hmm. you don't do that easily. That's not, that's, no, you know. It, it you, takes you, a little planning. It, it takes, sure it takes some thought. Um, and, you know, that's why, you know, we are offering this course, this mental health first aid course. It's an eight hour uh, class that anyone can take, any New Yorker can take it for free. Because for that exact reason that you said, no, it seems very mysterious. People don't, don't understand what to do. When, uh, when someone breaks a leg or someone's bleeding, we know immediately right. how to respond. Right? We right. know immediately what to do, but we never learn those skills of what to do when someone has a panic attack or someone is suffering from depression or anxiety. We just do not learn that. But we can learn how to identify the signs and symptoms uh, take, if, if we take that time to do so. You know what really uh, confused me was that Bo in both the case of Kate Spade and Anthony Bourdain, mm -hmm. that uh, it seemed like they were leading two separate lives, a kind of a public life that, e right. and involving their friends. I mean, it was like, mm -hmm. like whatever was going on inside of them mm -hmm. was happening on a level people didn't actually know about, right. and that lack of communication, that mm -hmm. you know, the, you be it becomes separate. Your mm -hmm. your your self that you you know take through the day and your inner demons mm -hmm. totally separate. Yes, and that is a very confusing and scary thing, I think, yes. and, and, mm -hmm. and difficult to try and figure out how to help people. Yes, but communication is key here. Uh, we have to really talk to the people who are our loved ones, our, our family members and friends, people we care about. We have to talk with them and, and not let people isolate themselves, not let people go into reclusion. I mean, that is one of the signs um, that, that people are not doing well when they you know, they, they isolate and don't talk about their emotions. Um, we, we can do uh, so much more to help people um, than we realize. Um, that's why it's so important for us to learn these skills. Kiara, your daughter, Yes. she made a video after Bo was elected mayor mm -hmm. saying she had a problem with alcohol and drug abuse. That's right. How was that for your family Number one, to have Kiara 
ha experiencing that because she said mm -hmm. it was because of depression during adolescence and then she wound up abusing drugs and alcohol. How was that for you as a mom? It was painful. Of course, it was painful. And um, you know, it was kind of hit home. And was we, I did not even know where to begin. Um, she was in college uh, when she made that video. And I realized then that, you know, <laughs> if I don't know what to do, then think of how many other parents are out there struggling with this same, same challenge. Yeah. Right? And I so said, that's, for me, that was, was probably the, the tipping point. And, uh, and so what mm -hmm. did you do? What, how did you figure out what to do? Well, you know, she had a very good therapist at college, and we figured it out. We figured it out together. I was, I was really fortunate, let me tell you. Very yeah. fortunate because yeah. I did my own, you know, searching around for the right place, the right, you know. I didn't even know if her diagnosis was correct, you know. But so how do you find out? And you find a lot mm -hmm. of um, the folks aren't, you know, they're just not that welcoming and re re receptive. Yeah. We do not have, have the kind of system that we need. Yeah. And do you feel that because you are a public person and you are the first lady, mm -hmm. that uh, that was so much more difficult for you oh, to absolutely. deal with? I, I mean, wasn't the, the first lady. We were, we, my husband was running for our office, so of course. But when she it, made the video, he had already been elected. Yes, yes. Yeah. But but during that time period, yeah. she yeah. she. Um, you know, she made that video right around Christmas time, I think. It was right, maybe right before Christmas. Um, but but the, the whole episode happened while he was running for office. Mm -hmm. So, of course, mm -hmm. it was very difficult. Yeah. I go, you know, who, who am I going to trust? <laughs> yeah. And also a sense of failure. I mean, mm -hmm. as a mom, you know, mm -hmm. we take a lot of things to heart. Mm -hmm. I have two grown sons, and I have two little grandchildren. And, you know, I look at my son, who's really a great father, and that is so cool to see him in the world mm -hmm. as a person, yes. you know, who's bringing up these wonderful children. Mm -hmm. But, you know, things happen, and you also blame yourself when there's a, a lack or a failure, and I've had that with my kids, too. Things mm -hmm. have gone wrong, and you feel like, mm -hmm. I let them down, or I, I didn't, I wasn't paying attention, or maybe I was too much involved in my own life, or... You know, and as a working mother, I always worried about that. Well, you know, as a mother, as a working mother, there's no way you can be perfect. I mean, yeah. you're never good enough. Yeah. I think that just kind of goes with the territory. Yeah. <laughs> and of yeah. course, I felt badly. Yeah. But I also know what I didn't know. And I was very proud of, of her for how she handled everything. Yeah. Yeah, I still am. She's just, she's just an amazing young woman. And what is she mm -hmm. doing now? Oh, you know, that's her life. <laughs> she, oh, okay. You want to talk to her? talk about her. talk to her. Okay. <laughs> I know your right? son is at, at Yale. Yeah, that's right. That's yeah. right. He'll be 21 in September, and yeah. you know, I won't be talking about him either. <laughs> that's it? Their, the cutoff? They have their own lives. <laughs> <laughs> but interestingly enough, mm -hmm. he wrote an article yes, about an the high school that yes. he went to, which was mm -hmm. Brooklyn Tech, a very elite high school mm -hmm. in New York City, saying, um, well, I definitely was a minority, and I was, you know, other students in this school are treated as a minority, and yes. they don't get the same opportunity right. to come to these, uh, the finest schools there are, because yes. they are minorities, and that mm -hmm. was... What did you think about that? I, I'm so proud of my children. I am. Um, I can't say uh, enough about them and how how thrilled I am that he took the initiative to write that article. And and um, both of them are, are excellent writers. And so I and to do something that I hope will affect the minds of, of many people. Actually, someone told me today uh, when I was in Park Slope. Uh, that they had read his op-ed, Dante's mm -hmm. op-ed, and thought it was very well written mm -hmm. and much needed. Mm -hmm. Now that's, you know, as, as a parent, I, it doesn't get better than that for right. me. <laughs> right. <laughs> How can you be prouder, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, yes. absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, you had an experience. I mean, you know, you look at uh, questions in this society of race, of sexuality, 
uh, you grew up in Massachusetts. That's in, right, Western in, Massachusetts. In Western Massachusetts, mm -hmm. in an area where you were the second black family to move in, mm -hmm. and there was a petition to get black people out of the neighborhood? Well, there's only one, so. There was one. <laughs> there, well, there was one in one heart path, part of the town, and my family was moving into the other half of the town. So there was, my understanding was there was a petition to prevent us from moving onto the block. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and you also had the experience of being like the only black person in your high school. Well, every class that I've been in from kindergarten through high school, I was the only black child in all of my classes. So, And so, mm -hmm. did you feel a part? Did you feel part of something? Or how did you feel? Well, you know, to tell that story would take longer <laughs> than 40 minutes, yeah. but... It was, um, I would say that, you know, well, here I am, you know, right. I survived. Right. It was not always a pleasant experience. It was often a hostile environment. You know, I, I did get chased home. I did get called names. I did, there were teachers who would not allow me in their classrooms. I, I can't, it was definitely not um, the best of experiences. Yeah. Uh, but my parents wanted us to get a good education, and they felt like that was the best choice. And you wound up in Wellesley. That's right. Hillary Clinton's yes. <laughs> alma mater. Yes. And, and so many others. And so yeah. many others, yeah. Madeline Albright. Madeline and, Albright, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Do you feel that there have been huge changes or moderate changes or not enough changes in the way that minorities are treated? Uh, since your experience as a kid? Well, you know, in New York, uh, there are no, it's a majority minority city. Mm -hmm. um, it's the, and that's the irony here, is that um, things have not changed as much as they should have. Yeah. Um, you know, the rules are, are, have been written to keep certain people out, yeah. and they remain the, the rules. And that, until that changes, we're not going to see much change. Do you feel that is true of the city's elite schools, of course. elite public schools, of that course. it is engineered in yes, some way because absolutely. of the tests that they have to take to get into the school? Absolutely. Those tests, that it were, closes designed, out minorities? Those tests were designed to keep um, children of color out. And so you're looking to change that. Bill's looking yes. to change that. Yes, it's just not. You know, those tests don't measure intelligence. Those tests don't measure... Um, ability, those tests um, are not fair. And mm -hmm. we certainly have, you know, we certainly have many amazingly gifted children um, of, of all ethnicities in this, in this city. And every one of them should have the opportunity to attend those schools. I know that another one of your subjects that you're really interested in mm -hmm. is safety in schools and gun violence. Mm -hmm. And that is an area we're just talking about segregation, but right. gun violence right. is really frightening. I mean, mm -hmm. when, you, when you send your kids to school and you can't be sure that your children are going to be safe in school, mm -hmm. and you have 17 people killed in Parkland in Florida, and then you have something like 288 incidents of gun violence mm -hmm. within a very short period of time, yes. this is not what's happening in other advanced countries in the world. No. That's that, another wrong direction that, that we're going that, in That's here. right. That's right. And that's why, you know, I always say mental health is the ultimate intersectional issue. It really affects so much more than what people think it does. Yeah. You know, and gun violence is a good example. You know, the number one um, tool that people use to take their own lives is a gun. Yeah. Right, and yeah. two thirds of all suicides are uh, committed using firearms. So obviously, we, we we need to do something about about guns in our country if we want to do something about suicide. Now you'll like this, right. and in New York City, the rate uh, for suicide yeah. is one half the national rate. That's interesting. It is, and what I think that's. Th what do you think is I going believe on there? that's a reflection of the fact that we do have strong gun control in New York City. Mm -hmm. The national rate is, is something like 13.1 per 100,000 people, and, but in New York City it's, it's closer to 6%. So, but, what, but we're talking about actually two different things because you're talking mm -hmm. about uh, gun violence 
by people who are mentally ill. So that's mm -hmm. one aspect of the gun violence. Right. But then what about? But that's the not the majority of gun violence. That's I mean, we pay attention, and they are, I mean, as we should to those incidents, but it's not the majority of, of gun violence. And there is so much more gun violence in terms of suicide than there are in terms of shootings. Now with those shootings, um, the cases that we have, have seen, um, many treated, many have um, been perpetrated by those who have untreated mental illness. Um, but people who have mental illness are not, are not generally violent. I mean, in fact, they're much more likely to be the victims of violence than the perpetrators. Um, but we haven't been having that conversation, that public conversation, the way we should. But there's an other factor to this gun violence, and mm -hmm. that is that people have access to these guns. That's and, right. And have access to guns that, you know, I keep saying, well, why does anybody need like an AK-47, whatever they have, mm -hmm. I don't know, a Kalashnikov, or they come in with these rapid fire, the, mm -hmm. ri the rifles that can yes. fire multiple bullets. and. It's not about need. <laughs> no, it is not about shooting a deer. No, I mean, come on. It's what not about is need. this? It's so mental illness, one part of it, okay, mm -hmm. but then we actually are endangering That's the right. public That's with, right. you know, firearms so, that, you know, what do you need that for? Yeah, it's a public health issue. It is a public mm -hmm. health issue, but how come we don't make advances by using that argument? Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's it seems like we've been talking about the same thing for a very long time. Yes. And that is is the too second bad. amendment. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, I don't want to take the second amendment uh -huh. away from anybody but I do want to have my kids safe in school that's right and I think a lot of people do and and mm -hmm. we can't seem to separate the yes you know those degrees and it's important to be able to do that it's hard to have a nuanced conversation I around know. these issues isn't you it know what? it's mm -hmm. hard to have a nuanced conversation in the political sphere it is. and I wonder how you feel about that mm -hmm. because I, I I'm not in the I'm not in politics mm -hmm. and I I probably will never run for office uh, but the I'm glad you didn't say never. <laughs> <laughs> you, on the other hand, we know may very well do no, that. May, I'm not going to say never, no. but, but yeah. uh, I'm not going to say I'm going to do it either. Mood-wise, mm -hmm. are you you're an optimistic kind of person? Are you like the glass half full kind of person? I, I am glass you half are. full. Yes, so I am. So, are you not discouraged by what by this kind of you know public arena at the moment and? Do you really actually have the energy to say, no, this is it's going to be okay because we're going to work to change it and change will happen and all of that? Change I, always happens. I know it does, but <laughs> I, I feel like mm -hmm. many people I talk to are quite discouraged mm -hmm. and feel like they don't understand what's going on and mm -hmm. they don't know how to change it. Yeah, no, well, there's no doubt it is a painful era for us right now. It yeah. really is. Yeah. I, I can't minimize that. But I do know that, you know, I'm, I'm 63 years old. I, I know that things will change. You look great. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's just like what Gloria Steinem said. Well, this is what 60 looks like, well, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, one thing I am optimistic about, and I'm probably not a glass half full person, is that this campaign to get people to register to vote mm -hmm. and against gun violence mm -hmm. is being led by young people. Yes. And I'm very, yes. I, I really think that is very exciting, except mm -hmm. I know how hard it is to build a movement. Mm -hmm. And so when you have the attention of the public, it's very fleeting, mm -hmm. and you know who knows what will come out of it. But the fact they're saying, we don't want this in right. our schools, we don't like this, and we have a voice, mm -hmm. and we are going to vote, you know. It makes a difference. That is a really, mm -hmm. I think, an interesting development. They will never forget what happened to them. Do you believe that? They will never forget what yeah. happened to them, and that is yeah. going to drive them to take action for the rest of their lives. Yeah. I believe that. You think so? You mm -hmm. think that this actually could be a movement that would be mm -hmm. that would move us past the dime, mm -hmm. you know, move the dime past wherever yeah, we are I, right I, now? I am sure that it's going to push the needle in a more positive direction. Did you, growing up, have this dream, oh, I'm going to be a dancer, I'm going to be a writer, I'm going to be a politician, I'm going to be a lawyer? Did you have... 
a particular thing that you kind of were going straight at, like an arrow, or no, not? You know, I think I, I, I wanted to be a librarian. Did you? Because <laughs> I could be around all those books. I thought that would be a great life. Yeah. <laughs> and then I wanted to be a writer. Uh, so I didn't move very far. This was mm -hmm. not the kind of life I envisioned for myself at all. <laughs> no, no. So, and were you very ambitious? Did you feel like, oh, I want a, like a big career, or did you? No, you know, I had no idea what kind of life I could make for myself. I really didn't. I didn't have very many role models. Um, not certainly not in my family. Mm -hmm. um, for first first girl in my family to go to college. I, I, I really didn't have a clue. So all I knew is that uh, it was important to get a good education and then find a job. And you did that. <laughs> I and did. you did that. Thank you. For Thank you, Carol. I really mm -hmm. appreciate it.